Some call me Steve, Dad, Husband or Friend. Others might call me Boss, Coach or Mentor. Today you can call me the Leadership Hacker. Thanks for listening in, I really appreciate it. My job as the Leadership Hacker is to hack into the minds, experiences, habits and learning of great leaders, C-suite executives, authors and development experts so that I can assist you developing your understanding and awareness of leadership. I'm Steve Rush and I'm your host today. I'm the author of Leadership Cake. I'm a transformation consultant and leadership coach and can't wait to start sharing all things leadership with you. Our special guest on today's show is Preston Weeks. He's the co-author of How to Be Up in Down Times. He's a business builder and entrepreneur and chief strategy officer and co-founder of Operations X. Before we get a chance to speak with Preston, it's a leadership hacker news. Do you believe in fate? In the news today, we explore a really strange twist of fate. A kayaker who discovered a message in a bottle floating in the Delaware River was able to reunite the letter with the woman who wrote it 35 years ago. Brad Waxmuth thought the bottle bobbing in the water about two miles offshore of the Broadkill River was a piece of trash when he spotted it in August. It was just a few days after a tropical storm had swept through the area. He told WBOC TV, as we usually do as kayakers, we try and pick up the trash out of the water as and when we can. But Brad's friend noticed there was something inside, and the two fished out the letter, written by Kathy Riddle and her cousin Stacey Wells, dated 35 years ago, 1985. They described their family pets, and they asked future potential readers if they had any of their own, and amongst other things, any childhood musings. Brad took the letter to the Milton Historical Society, and a curator had reached out to the family and put the two in touch. Riddle still only lived a few miles away in Milton and Brad was able to reunite the letter to her that week. He said he was really surprised it ended up in the same waters decades later after the storms and tides. But maybe it was fate and maybe the letter had gone all the way around the world and arrived back in the same place. Who knows? What we do know is two people come together for no other reason through connectivity and the leadership lesson here is Whenever you send out a message, you never know how it's going to be landed and indeed when it's going to be truly understood. And it's fair to say it's unlikely that your method of communication is going to be a letter in a bottle, but please be making sure that you know what you're saying, how you're saying it and who it's going to. Because we all receive communication and we all interpret data and information subtly differently. That's been a Leadership Hacking News. If you have any quirky, funny, interesting stories you want our listeners to hear, please get in touch. I'm joined on the show today by Preston Weeks. He's an author, a business builder and entrepreneur. He's a chief strategy officer and co-founder of Operation X. And to boot, he's a super, super car enthusiast. Preston, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm excited. So I asked you before we got on the show, you know, as a car freak, what's your wheels? And I'm, I'm sure as people are hearing, you're a car enthusiast. Just tell us a little bit about where the car enthusiasm comes from and what it is you drive at the moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I've been a car nut ever since I was a little kid. I was two years old and I'd ride around when kids didn't have to sit on seatbelts. I'd ride on the bump of my dad's big Cadillac and he'd have challenges with his friends to name every oncoming car that we'd pass and I could beat all his friends at two and three years old. So I've been a car nut ever since I could walk or ever since I was born. But And then I bought and sold cooler cars to so I could up my car from ever since I was 16 and uh but now you know I've I've been lucky I've had a lot of amazing cars I drive uh, I, I don't have anything too crazy right now but I've got an old uh, Z3 or M M coupe they call it for the for the car enthusiasts they, it's got the nickname the clown shoe it's a little hatchback uh M3 motor that's pretty much full track built car and got a few other fun toys up my sleeve too but uh yeah, I, I absolutely love cars. And anyone that likes cars, they're my immediate best friend. So you're the kind of guy that we want to be on a long journey with when we try and spot the oncoming cars and guess the car game, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want me on your team. Yeah, for sure. 
with that. No, I, yeah, I've done, I've done a lot with cars. I've done a little racing. I was in Porsche Club and some different things like that. So, yeah, I, I just I love 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 cars. Awesome. And of course, you're now co-founder and chief strategy officer at Operations X. We're going to learn a little bit about what you do in a moment. But tell us a little bit about the backstory as to how you arrived doing what you do now. Yeah. So I actually started in the car business. So indirectly led me into what I was doing today. So I had to figure out how to pay for college. That was one of my challenges. I wanted to go to college, decided I wanted to go. And so I was ready to go and had to figure out how to pay. I knew cars. So I bought a, and sold cars and helped me pay my way through college, paid my tuition. And when I graduated, I couldn't find a job that paid me better. And so I went on and I went uh, on doing it and I built a dealership and then built more dealerships and then ended up owning and co-owning 15 different car dealerships, uh, which it, with a lot of verticals that came out of that from, you know, paint shops to mechanic shops to a finance company and uh, all the other things that went with it. But uh, it all started with one one sixteen hundred dollar car and I invested in myself and I had I had that sixteen hundred dollar car. I remember the first time I went to the auction, I went up there, got up to the auction, I bought the car, I get ten minutes out of the auction, the car overheats, and I chalk it up to a, a learning curve and I didn't even have enough money to tow the car back to my area to my mechanic. So I, I take like five hours and I limp the thing home and let it cool down and drive a minute and let it cool down and drive a minute. But uh, I, I ended up taking that and I thought, okay, what can I control? What do I know I can do? You know, I know I can do this. I know there's different investments and things like that. But if I invest it in myself, I'm not afraid to work. I'm not afraid to do it. And I know I can, I can have control over it. So I did it and I kept doing it and reinvesting it myself and learned the business. And then I got two cars and then I got to 10 cars and then I got, you know, into my second dealership and then it just kept growing and growing from there. And little would your dad know that sitting on his Cadillac at two would create a business empire that allowed you to then pivot away from cars to do what you do now. So tell us how that came about. Yeah. So the transition. So back in 2010, I was running my dealerships and trying to figure out things and build and grow. And as a business owner and an entrepreneur and especially a small business owner or startup, you know, money is always a problem and personnel is always a challenge. And I, I had the lucky, lucky blessing of someone coming to me and saying, hey, there's another option. And I had a cousin that worked in an outsourcing office. It was based in Salt Lake City, Utah. And she had placed me with my first, she connected me with my first overseas employee. So I started in 2010 uh, outsourcing work overseas. And that became the weapon that all the other car dealerships didn't have. It gave us a cutting edge above everyone else. It gave me the ability to not only you know grow and expand and be able to afford to do it, but also hire on people on my frontline staff too. And what it did was take my frontline salespeople and actually allow them to focus on the customer and allow them to focus on you know the sale and allow them to focus on what actually made the money. And so you know going through that and seeing that and you know really having that help me so much and help me grow and you know do all those things i thought how cool would that be to be able to provide that for other people someday and i continued to use that in my in my businesses throughout and so i was in the car business i actually got recruited uh by a gentleman named mark victor hansen who is a famous uh author one of the top selling authors in the world known for chicken soup for the soul book series uh one minute millionaire latin factor and a number of other things. He's got 59 New uh, York Times number one bestsellers, uh, 309 bestsellers, tons of, he's just been amazing. But uh, he sold the Chicken Soup Company in 2008 and wanted to invest in renewable technology. So he pulled me out of the car business. He knew me, we knew each other and he had seen what I'd done in the automotive industry, he pulled me out of there and we started renewable energy company. So we went off that way for a while and uh, built that and it sold that, which was great. And um, now, now it's put me in the position to where I can focus on helping other companies and helping these people that have been, that are going through the challenges that I've been through and that are trying to make it or they're trying to you know, be more successful or grow their business or you know, be able to do all, all these things. And so 
I love being able to do that. And I love being able to be a part of that. And now I, you know, still work on projects all the time with Mark and I have all these, you know, great people. And, you know, we wrote this book uh, together, How to Be Up and Down Times with Mitzi Purdue. Mitzi, her, her background is uh, from a company called Purdue Farms. They're the, I think the third largest chicken company in the world. And uh, she's just an amazing person. They, they ran Purdue Farms. Uh, her dad actually started Sheridan Hotels, which is uh, <laughs> one of the biggest, you know, one, one of the more well-known hotel chains around the world. It certainly is. Yeah. So she's, she's a pretty amazing person. But yeah, I've been fortunate to, uh, you know, be able to surround myself with all these amazing people and keep doing uh, business to serve others because I, th I think that's all it's about really and serving others is the kind of core proposition isn't it of operations x now so when you start to think about how businesses are set up one of the common mistakes i often observe in other businesses is that whole resistance to outsource and, and you called it early by saying that you know you focused on getting your frontline people focused on the key activities where they could add most value and removed some of the noise. Yeah. What, what do you think the reason is that some businesses just get stuck and don't embrace that opportunity? Well, you know, people like control. You have, you have an alpha, you know, red leader of a company. You know, they want to have control over their company. And so remote work has been you know, a learning curve for people. And thankfully for me, with this whole COVID thing, it's proved it. So now, now I don't have to prove remote work anymore. Now, either people know, okay, remote works for me, or I absolutely hate it. And it doesn't work for my company. It's going to make me fail. But you've got an opinion. One way or another, you've got an opinion on remote work. Sure. And oftentimes, remote work is incredibly successful, especially now with the emerging technology platforms and different things, the way you know, we connect. With people, and so I think a lot of times, you know, that transition of going, okay, you know, to go from, you know, overseas, you know, people don't want to give away control, and people also uh, think about risk, you know, naturally, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to send all my stuff away somewhere, someone I don't know, you know, kind of a thing. But what's interesting, and what's what's really great that when people get into remote work, they realize these are just people; they just live somewhere else. <laughs> It's not like some, you know, big, crazy conspiracy thing or, you know, it, if you find the people that have the skills that you need and communicate the way you want them to communicate, then there's no reason not to work with people around the world. And you know, if you want me to get into it a little bit, I, I really think there's some big changing trends, you know, coming up, obviously. We, we've gone through crazy trends. We've gone through 10 years of change in three months yep. across the world. Uh, I, I really believe that. And I could probably go off for a long time about that, but I won't right now. But, you know, looking at more changes in the pipeline, you know, all the real estate uh, and workforce situation is going to change. You know, what are offices going to look like for companies? What does the home environment look like for work? How does the computer and the family and everything play in together? with that and so you know that stuff's happening and, and a trend that's going to follow that because people like now a lot of people are liking working from home because they go well shoot i just had to you know commute an hour to work say let's say you have to commute an hour to work well you just picked up an extra over a work day by working from home because over your five hour work week you just picked up 10 hours if you work in an eight hour day you just work, you, you have over an extra day of your life back every single week if you're working from home. And so, you know, I, I think the trend's going to keep going that way. And, and then I think another, uh, you know, side effect thing that's going to fall out of that, that if people aren't paying attention to right now and keeping their head up, they'll find themselves behind the eight ball a little bit. Because if, so let's say remote work's adopted. Let's just say, let's just agree on that. Let's just say right. some percentage remote work, the world adopted it. So now why, what's stopping us from having borders on remote work? Mm, exactly. Yeah. What do you think is stopping us? Is there anything? Nothing. It's, well, in it's past perception, it's, it's trust, it's control, you know, it's those things. And in certain businesses, you know, you, there's some of those things that you can't overcome, like highly sensitive information and you know, certain processes or government things. Or, uh, but 
uh, most businesses, you know, you can, you can get around that once you kind of open yourself up to it. And so, yeah, it's, it's just been uh, amazing. And our offices are based uh, in the Philippines. Most of the remote employees we've worked with have been in the Philippines, which has been a really great fit for our culture here because it's predominantly, they follow a lot of predominantly Western culture. Their things line up that are similar, you know, that, that tend to make those transitions easier, you know, so there's less teaching, less understanding, less breakdowns and things like that. Once people understand, you know, that it, this sounds strange, I mean, saying it out loud, but when I meet with clients or companies here in, in the United States, initially, they immediately think less of the people that are not around them. You know, so they go, oh, if I'm going to hire a remote team, they're not going to be as good as the team, you know, that lives on my street. And it, there's this weird kind of thing that happens that it's a breakdown. And actually, a lot of these people, I mean, they're just as good or better than people you'd find because they're just people. They're just normal people. Yep. You're going to find good ones. You're going to find bad ones. And there's some of the most hardworking and talented people, you know, all over the world. So it's going to be interesting to see you know, what that looks like in the future with like the breakdown of work borders and then AI, you know, in, in, incorporation of AI into different things. I think our world is going to get yep. so fast in the next 10 years. And it's, I could go on and on for that, but yeah. And I wonder also, if you think about the dynamic of recruiting somebody remotely, you, you haven't got the physical biases that you might have when you first meet somebody, right? So you haven't got the handshake. Mm -hmm. You haven't got the mm -hmm. the broader perspective of them. You might not be able to see their their height, their size, their weight, all of which unconsciously we carry some of these biases around with us. Whether they're good, bad, or indifferent, we all have them. And given that the fact that they're not present, I suspect and I wonder if we're more thoughtful about the recruitment process for hiring the person to their skill set yeah. directly. Yep. It, and that's actually, you know, an interesting thing because if you look at the mentality of hiring, it, it is very natural for companies to hire demographically similar people. And you look at that as the culture of a company and you go, well, you know, maybe there's some advantages if there's a very narrow niche market company that they're dealing with, but, you know, maybe they're lacking some diversity and they're missing out on some market opportunity or, uh, you know, different things like that too, you know, that, that actually naturally happens in the hiring process where you go, okay, you know, you see a lot a company with a lot of older people in it, they hire a lot of older people. They don't fill in a lot of, or you see a, lot, a company with a lot of younger people and, they don't hire a lot of older people. And so, yeah, there's these interesting, yeah, dynamics with hiring. And if you go back to, you know, just basically skill set, I mean, that does that does bring this raw authenticity to it. That's kind of great. And and that's where we, our, our company comes in is we're trying to help people because people don't know, you know, people don't know how, how, how the heck do I do this? How can I trust some guy to give my information? They're across the, you know, ocean. I can't, you know, go knock on their door if there's a problem. So, you know, we bring connectedness and we bring local representation too. So say if you were pr uh, placing employees with me and I was your account rep, you know, you'd have your team there and they'd be working in our offices and we'd help you get that all set up and everything. But if you ever had a problem with it, you'd call Preston and say, hey, hey, Preston, there's a problem here. Can you help me figure this out? And we sort it out and we offboard them. We hired someone else. We figure out if there's a breakdown in uh, communication and try and resolve it. And so we do all those other things to help support it because it's our goal to make successful outsourced relationships work and make them last and make them strong. Super fascinating. You've written a book, How to Be Up in Down Times with Mark Victor Hansen and Mitzi Perdue. How did the book come about? Yeah, so it was actually funny. I was in a consulting meeting with uh, Mark and, and Mitzi. They're both uh, very good friends of mine. and. Uh, we were talking and Mitzi was saying it was just very, very, very early when the first words of the whole COVID thing were happening. Mitzi is a really, really smart lady that has a lot of uh, medical background and things like that. And so she says, hey, I want to do a book that's 52 ways to help keep people safe from COVID. And her legal team said, no, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> if someone's going to get sick, you're going to get sued, you, know, you can't go out there and provide medical advice to an emerging uh, disease that no one knows anything about. 
And so, you know, she said that and she was disappointed. We were on a phone call and I, and I said, well, how about you just do a book, 52 Ways to Stay Positive During Isolation? Because now the world's going on lockdown. And she's like, I love that idea. And basically we started collaborating and just had this mind melt of, you know, flow of great ideas and brought Mark in. And uh, it, it was just this, this brainstorm of positivity to in our our goal was to help people and give people what they needed right now and so we took all the information we knew and we took all the information from all the experts that we know which uh that you could ever even want to access but uh yeah we we put this together and we did it to serve people and we did it you know i mean if you look on amazon I, we price the thing as low as possible because we want to help people we want to pay it forward I want to up people's lives right now when they're having a challenge, when they're having a downtime. And that's that's how all of this came about. And so it's really from my heart and Mark's heart and Mitzi's heart to go on and help the world. And I love that principle because it is very philanthropic when you read it. And you've got three kind of approaches when you look at the book. You've got the soul tips, the mind tips and the body tips. I thought what would be kind of neat is if we maybe just take a, a couple of those tips out of the book just to give a flavor to our listeners as to kind of how you've kicked it around and, and what that means. Yep. So under soul tips, you've got negative news, how to deal with it. How do you deal with negative news? Yeah, I mean, well, this is a big, big, big issue, you know, right now. I mean, how, how I deal with it, tell you the truth, I, I'm probably a little more extreme. I don't even have TV in my house. I don't even have, I mean... I, We've got all of our, you know, digital things and I get the news and I listen to the news briefs every morning and, you know, those things. And uh, we've got every sort of, I think, online streaming uh, thing you could possibly have. But yeah, I just, I don't have any network television in my home because, you know, it's just this pounding, pounding, relentless negativity. And really what you surround yourself with weighs so heavily on yourself. And a lot of times we don't realize it. And so now I had a conversation with a good smart friend the other day and he he had a great reverse engineering idea, which I love the approach in life to reverse engineering everything. But he said, if you're stressed out or if you're feeling anxiety or if you're feeling these things, he's like, take a look, take, just take a conscious look at what you're watching. Are your, sh are your TV shows stressful TV shows? As the news you're watching you know, stressful news that you're consuming because you're putting in all these subconscious factors into your body and into your mind and it sits in you and, and it stays. And I mean, in the beginning of this whole kind of section, I have a chapter called Your Position in the World. Really quickly to kind of pin that down, it, it all comes down to yourself. We really need to take care of ourselves because if we can't take care of ourselves, then it's so much harder to go take care of. It's inauthentic to go take care of other people. It is, yeah. Yeah. And so we really need to have that solid, solid grounding. And then that, you know, we give a lot of different tips to do that and go through these different, you know, methods to go, okay, you know, how can we get centered? How can we do this? How can we be better? How can we, and then, you know, move on from there. What's the next step? That's great. And then under my tips, one thing that really intrigued me when I read that was, around how music brings results. Just tell us a little bit about the research you've done on that. Yeah, so uh, I am friends with a guy named Dr. Bernard Bendock. He's the head of neurology uh, for Arizona, and he's the head of neurology for the Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic's a really, uh, really prestigious hospital. Uh, so he is like literally one of the, the top, top guys with brains. And I had the amazing experience of sharing uh, Easter with him. And so we were sitting there chatting and talking. And he was telling me about the two ways to basically, you know, make your brain strong and make your brain last. Because there's always things like Alzheimer's and dementia and things that people fight. And, you know, how do we make that better? How do we make our brain more powerful? And he said, he gave me the two tips. And one of them's music. And the other one is actually language. He said the two most powerful interactive things in all studies they've done when they tear apart the top of your head and they plug in all those electrodes and they see what's firing when they do these tests, 
because you're awake when they do the brain surgeries, which is so amazing anyway. But they, they actually have people come in, they're playing the piano and doing things and they're doing these tests on them. And music lights up more places in your brain than pretty much any other function of, you know, of what you can do. And so it's one of the top exercises. And what, what Dr. Bendock says is that your brain is like a muscle, you know, and just like exercising, just like, like if you get a cast, if you break your arm and your arm's stuck in a cast, can't use it, you get your cast off four weeks later and your arm's weak. It's not strong. It's fatigued. Well, your brain's the same way. And so if we're not doing things and, you know, daily, if we can, you know, to push our brains, to try to do something, to try to learn, to try to you know, do that, then our brain is like that muscle. It's, it's fatiguing. I mean, it might be kind of, you know, staying there. Okay. So I have a mantra called, I, I like to say relentless improvement. And I have this theory that the world's always moving. So it's, it's, it literally is the world's moving. I'm sitting here in my office, I'm not moving, but everything around me is moving. All these people are doing things, all these, you know, people are getting things done, they're working, they're, you know, learning, you know, life's happening around me. And so that's creating this motion, this inherent motion around me that's always happening. And so I am either progressing or digressing because if everything around me is moving forward and I'm not, then I'm going backward. That's a really neat way of looking at it, actually. Yeah, that's a little personal, you know, that's from my life of action training and stuff. So back to the music thing, you know, if we can do things like, you know, learn a new instrument, that will help your mental acuity, you know, throughout late into your life. So we should always be trying to do those things. I bought a drum set the other day. Well, not the other day, a couple months ago. <laughs> but I, I don't know how to play drums, but I stuck in my office and when I want to break, I put my headphones on and I just go rock out and it probably sounds terrible, but I've got noise canceling headphones on, on my head and I sound like a rock star. So I don't care. And I'm having a lot of fun, but <laughs> it's, it's also a kind of therapy as well, isn't it? Cause from a, from a mindfulness perspective, when you, you really focus on a piece of music, you just love, oh, yeah. you don't think of anything else. You just get focused in the moment, which also not only is it a stimuli, then it helps bec yep. you become more centered because you're more mindful. Oh, and the drums are too. Cause it's like a physical manifestation of your, you know, beating of your rhythm and so I like it. yeah lovely and then in your body tip section one thing that I found really fun to get my head around was you have this section called don't forget your thumbs tell us about that well you know what's what's funny is I myself personally am kind of an OCD hand cleaner <laughs> and uh, even more so now I guess yeah e even more so now but you know just going back to it, like the body tips, you know, the body tips itself. Don't forget your thumbs. Like these things that we do to our body are, and, you know, we have that, uh, Tyler, your health is wealth, but kind of starts out, you know, the body section, but, um, you know, really taking care of yourself and paying attention to those details and not you know, missing it and thinking about it and being conscientious, you know, I mean, with, with the whole pandemic thing and the whole, you know, getting sick thing. And I think a lot of times people don't realize, I think it's just being aware, you know, how much you touch things. And, you know, like I watch it cause I've got kids. And so, you know, my kids, I go, oh, oh, wash your hands. You know, it's like, go oh, wash your hands, make them sure they wash their hands really well. And then they turn around and they grab a toilet. I'm like, well, okay, that was pointless now. <laughs> and so if we're washing it, our hands, I mean, it's a, such a silly thing. You know, you wash your hands and people don't think about their thumbs. They rub their hands together and they don't get through. So it's that attention to detail. It's that like bringing that little attention to detail. But that's the one thing with the book is, you know, how to be up and down times with having soul, mind and body tips. You know, they're fun tips. They're quick, easy reads. And what we want to do is look at it comprehensively. Because if you're sick, you know, your mind's not going to be doing well. You can't be focusing. You can't be exercising. You can't be doing all these things. So, you know, all these things go all hand in hand together to make us be vehicles of positivity and to be vehicles of change and to be able to make a difference and to be able to help come out of 
you know, these crazy things and these crazy right. times that are happening. Yeah, definitely so. So this part of the show is where I get to turn the leadership lens on you. So you're not only a business builder for others, but you run your own businesses and as such have been a leader for a number of years. So this is where I want to tap into your leadership thinking, your leadership brain. And the first place I'd like to start is if you could just share with our listeners, what would be your top three leadership hacks? So yeah, top three leadership hacks. I would say my mantra, number one is relentless improvement. You always need to be improving so leadership hack you got to keep your head up so relentless improvement uh leadership hack number two i would say is uh don't be afraid to fail and an extra one too that kind of goes along that don't be afraid to fail is if you do fail you're not a failure and uh you know i I think a lot of people have a hard time differentiating that if if they have a business that fails or an idea that fails or a part of a business that fails or a plan or a product, you're not a failure. It's just that thing. You just got to get back up and keep that relentless improvement. So don't be afraid to fail. Right. And then find, you know, a leadership hack is know deeply what your weaknesses are and fill those weaknesses with people that are strong in those areas. I would say that is is huge, huge is being able to acknowledge, you know, what your weaknesses are, because a lot of times leaders have challenges doing that. And because we want to be that, you know, person that knows everyone, everything and can do everything. And if you can go, no, that's not me and surround yourself by a team that is that, then you can be really powerful. Yeah. Super great hacks, uh, Preston. Thank you. So the next bit of the show is we call hack to attack. And this is where something in your past hasn't gone as well as you'd anticipated. Maybe something's screwed up or we've bumped into some adversity. But as a result of whatever's happened, we've now learned from that and it's become a lesson in our life. What would be your hack to attack? Yeah, hack to attack. I think a hack to attack it goes back to a story that I would say let I would title let people fail. I hack to attack. I like I'm an, a hard worker. I'm a, a doer. I figure things out. I, you know, am the type I think I can do anything. And, you know, leading, a t- leading teams, I found back uh, a long time ago that I was leading these teams and I had a number of employees and I'm bouncing around from location to location. Things are good, but I'm just busier than I've ever been in my life. And I'm doing everything. You know, someone's got a problem. I'm running over there. I'm, you know, trying to get things done, trying to get fast. I'm fixing it. So my assistant comes up and they say, Hey, I can't figure out how to do this. So I just do it and I fix it. And my account comes up and says, Hey, you know, I don't know how to do this. So you know, I just kind of do it and fix it. And then my you know, sales guy goes, oh, I can't close this deal. Can you help me come close this client? So I go over and I close the client. And then the detail guy is like, oh, I can't fix this part or get this stain out of the car. So I go over and I just do it. But it hit, hit, hit me. The, this epiphany of growth, you know, transition, uh, in a company to go, Hey, I am, um, you know, growing and I'm doing all these things and I'm the one that knows how to do all these things because I built this business and I have a certain way I want them done, but I need to let these people go out and fail so they can learn. Because if I don't let people fail and I don't let people learn and I don't let people go out and do it on their own, then I'm just creating more jobs for myself and I'm not replicating myself. I'm just creating more burdens for myself. And so you need to have that runway with your employee team, you know, to, to have them go out and fail and do and go out and fail and do. It's just like, my virtual assistant that I have for myself that she helps me with. She's doing stuff for me right now as we're talking, but uh, there's things that are probably beyond her ability level from me learning. I have her do those things all the time. I go, Hey, go write this. I might not even use it, but it might give me some good ideas, you know, of what I'm going to do. But I like to push people and push my employees so that they can learn and they can grow, which was the opposite of what I was doing, which was a big failure. All of a sudden, you know, I'm at one of my locations. I've got 11 employees at the lot and I show up at that lot. All of a sudden I have 11 jobs 
Yeah. And everyone, everyone's running up to me to do all those jobs. Yeah. And so it's really differentiating that, you know, from management position going, okay, you know, you set your employees up for success and let them fail. And reframing the failure of a task is just another way of saying I've learned something new. Yep, exactly. And then it goes back to brilliant, relentless improvement. Yeah, definitely. The last thing we want to explore with you today, Preston, is if you had the opportunity to do a bit of time travel now, you get to go back to when you were 21 and give yourself some advice. What's it going to be? You know, if I if I were going to go back and give myself advice, um, I, I would say... Uh, there's so many things I would want to say, but you know, I really, really like starting things grassroots. And I had a bunch of car dealerships that uh, I started, you know, with my own money in finance, and then I had a business partner, and then I got to this point where I had some issues with the business partner, so I wanted to leave. So I left the business partner, started up another company, and replaced that business partner with financing his portion of that company. My my 2020 hindsight is. You know, if it, an advice to look back is if you have the ability to not finance anything in your company and do it from grassroots to build equity, do it. Because in the beginning, it might be worse, but in the long term, it's in the end. And I mean, I've done okay. I've been, I've been fine. I've been aggressive and keep, keep fighting. But I, I look back at that and go, okay, you know, if I had done that with that company, you know, differently. I might have more money to do more things with. So uh, that's that's one of those, you know, learning courses to go, okay, if you can build your own equity instead of building financing and working for the banks, start small and get nitty gritty and fight it out because 10 years later, you'll be happy you did it. I like that. People often have the perception that, you know, financing helps you grow quicker. But actually, it can hamstring you if you don't get your supply chain right, you don't get your inventory right, etc. Versus, there does come with it, though, the rub of you need to be more patient if you're going to grow organically. And that's the rub, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. And when it, and just to you know bring even a little bit more depth to that comment of my story, you know, on that lot, when we shut that lot down, uh, you know, so I, I had 15 dealerships this is one of them. And when we shut that lot down... You know, that was the one coming out of the partnership. And, you know, we had car inventory that we owned, which was fine and it was good when we shut that lot down. But we also had a million and a half in financing. And if we didn't have a million and a half in financing, during the course of the that car lot's existence, that million and a half would have been equity. Right. And so life would have looked a little different in between. But, uh, yeah, so that's that's my look back old wise word great lessons thanks for sharing that with our listeners too so as folk have been listening to you speak today Preston they may be thinking where do I find out a little bit more about operations x how do I find out a little bit more about how to be up in down times and what about the work that Preston's doing where would you like to send them yeah I mean mostly everything you can find is on operationsx.com it's operations with a plural and then just the letter x and so you can check me out on LinkedIn too. LinkedIn, I think it's backslash energy guy is my uh, profile or whatever. But yeah, Preston Weeks, W-E-E-K-E-S. And uh, I'm happy to help people. You know, it's just, it's truly, truly my mission uh, to make the entrepreneur succeed. And I absolutely love and appreciate all these amazing business owners and CEOs that I get to coach and consult with and work with to help grow their businesses. And it's absolutely so much fun. I met so many amazing people along the way, like Mark Victor Hansen and Mitzi and, you know, just these crazy big leaders of, you know, our country, <laughs> billionaires and Andy Sabins and Trammell Crows and Ben Carson and all these cool people. I've had a lot of fun. And, you know, the best thing about working with great people like this is that you never stop learning either. Mm-hmm. And that's what I love about what I do too. Yep. Well, that, that's your relentless improvement. It is. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Awesome. Preston, from my perspective, I just want to say a massive thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today on the Leadership Hacker Podcast. You've been a super guest and good luck with whatever you do next. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Stay safe. Great talking to you. Keep up the amazing work. 
And uh, everyone out there, have a fantastic day. Thanks very much, Preston. Take care. I genuinely want to say a heartfelt thanks for taking time out of your day to listen in too. We do this in the service of helping others and spreading the word of leadership. Without you listening in, there would be no show. So please subscribe now if you haven't done so already. Share this podcast with your communities and network and help us develop a community and a tribe of leadership hackers. And finally, if you'd like me to work with your senior team, your leadership community, keynote an event, or you would like to sponsor an episode, please connect with us via our social media. And you can do that by following and liking our pages on Twitter and Facebook. Our handle there is at Leadership Hacker. Instagram, you can find us there at the underscore leadership underscore hacker. And at YouTube, we're just Leadership Hacker. So that's me signing off. I'm Steve Rush, and I've been the Leadership Hacker. Thank you.